Half a century has passed since the invention of the Rubik's Cube. And chances are, you've played with it at least once. Maybe you even have your own strategy to solve a scrambled cube back into its original state. Even today, some kids are eager to take the challenge of mastering this timeless puzzle. Beyond the solved configuration, there are many visually striking patterns with fun names like Slash, Anaconda, Giftbox, Union Jack and many more. All these configurations exhibit some sort of symmetry or appealing structure. However, most of the cube's possible configurations look nothing like that. Instead, they are a chaotic mix of six colors arranged in seemingly random patterns. The complexity of this toy arises from the sheer number of possible configurations. In total, there are more than 43 quintillion, that is 43 million, million, million unique states. Sounds like a big number, right? Let's put it into perspective. If a computer program created a million of these configurations each second, it would have to run for more than a million years to generate all of the 43 quintillion configurations. The information of a single state can be squeezed into roughly 50 bytes. Storing all configurations would then require about 2 million hard drives, which probably corresponds to the cloud space of several hundred Google-sized companies. If we physically stacked 43 quintillion Rubik's cubes, the tower would stretch over 250 light years high. A beam of light emitted from the bottom would take 250 years to reach the top. From that dizzying height looking back, the sun would appear as just another tiny star in the vast night sky. But here's the real question. How do we even calculate a number this huge? First of all, this number is a highly composite number. This means it is built from the product of many smaller numbers. Each of these smaller numbers comes from the different choices we can make for the tiny cubies that make up the magic cube. In what comes next, we'll break down the computation step by step, using visuals to make it as intuitive as possible. By the end, you'll not only understand where this gigantic number comes from, but you also gain a whole new appreciation for the hidden secrets behind the Rubik's Cube. So let's start right away. The process of counting all possible configurations actually starts with a screwdriver. By taking the magic cube apart, we reduce it to its 8 corner pieces and 12 edge pieces. Once disassembled, the real question becomes how many different ways can we put these pieces back together. Let's start by placing the edge pieces back into the cube. The first edge piece can go into any of the 12 available edge positions. Once it is placed, the second edge has 11 remaining slots to choose from. The third edge has 10 possible slots and this pattern continues until all 12 edges are positioned. This way, we have found already 480 million configurations. But placing these 12 edges is not the end of the story. There is another crucial detail. Each edge piece can be placed in two possible orientations, flipped one way or the other. This means the first edge has two choices. And for each choice of the first edge, there will be two more choices for the orientation of the second edge. The same thing is true for the third and all the remaining edge pieces. So for each edge, we have to double the total number of configurations. Therefore, our total count increases roughly 4000 times. Now let's count the corner pieces. And luckily, the procedure is quite similar. The first corner can go into any of the eight available positions. Once it is placed, the second corner has seven remaining spots. The third corner has six choices and this pattern continues. By the time we reach the seventh corner, there are only two possible locations left. Finally, the last corner has no choice. It must go into the remaining empty spot. And since this counting of the corner pieces can be independently performed for any of the already existing configurations, we increase the number of configurations again by a factor of roughly 40,000. Just like with the edges, placing the corners is only part of the story. 
Each corner piece can also be twisted in three different orientations, which adds another layer to the counting process. This means that each of the three possible rotations of the first corner piece can be combined with three possible orientations of the second corner piece and so on. When all the factors are multiplied, we end up with a ridiculously large number of more than 500 quintillion. These scrambled states are often called screwdriver configurations, since they are created by taking the cube apart and randomly reassembling it. But here's the catch. Most of these configurations are impossible to solve. If you take a random screwdriver configuration, chances are you won't be able to twist the cube back to its solved state, no matter how many moves you try. In fact, only one out of every 12 of these randomly assembled cubes is actually a valid configuration, one that can be solved purely through legal phase rotations. So what causes these restrictions and how do we adjust our count to get the true number of solvable states? Let us see how we can detect and remove these inappropriate configurations from our count. In the solved state, we can assign orientation numbers, either 0 or 1, to each phase of the edge pieces. These numbers stay fixed relative to the center pieces of the cube, which means that they do not rotate when we twist the cube. Additionally, each face that is initially assigned with a zero orientation number is painted in light blue. The color moves with the face as the cube is twisted. Interestingly, no matter how we twist the cube, the total sum of orientation numbers in front of the colored faces always remains even. You can check this for every possible move. The sum always changes by an even amount. The transformations on the screen demonstrate that every even number between 0 and 12 is achievable. In this particular example, we arrive at the super flip configuration, where every edge is flipped while the corner pieces remain unchanged. As a fun fact, if we apply this transformation again, it restores the cube to its original state. This rule that the sum of orientation numbers must be even introduces a constraint on the edge orientations. Going back to our screwdriver configurations, we can freely choose the orientation of 11 edges. However, the orientation of the last edge is determined by the requirement that the sum remains even. This restriction eliminates half of the screwdriver configurations. A very similar constraint arises for the orientation of the corner pieces. Again, we assign orientation numbers. Since each corner has three faces, we use the numbers 0, 1 and 2. The numbers cycle clockwise around each corner. These orientation numbers, just like the edge numbers, do not rotate when the cube is twisted. By assigning these numbers, we effectively define the orientation of the corner faces. To make it easier to track, we we'll color the faces initially labeled with 0. No matter how we twist the cube, this time the sum of all orientation numbers in front of the colored faces is always divisible by 3. You can check that every possible turn can only change the sum by a multiple of 3. And just like with the edges, we show a transformation where every possible multiple of 3 is actually achieved. We end up with a super flip-like configuration, where this time the corners are all turned and the edges are unchanged. After applying this transformation three times, the original cube is restored again. What does this rule imply for our screwdriver configurations? Again, we can freely choose the orientation of 7 out of 8 corners. However, the orientation of the last corner is automatically determined by the constraint that the sum of all orientation numbers must be divisible by 3. This means that only one third of the remaining screwdriver configurations are valid based on this corner orientation restriction. So far, we've been looking at edge and corner pieces completely separately. But it would be pretty surprising if there wasn't any connection between them, especially since they rotate in combination during each and every twist. Let us make things clearer by labeling each QB. When we twist the cube, the rearrangement of QBs can be expressed with cycles. The first cycle states, that the QB3 
goes where QB1 has been before. QB9 takes the position of QB3, QB7 moves to the old position of QB9, and QB1 ends up at the spot of QB7. This is a 4 cycle, meaning that 4 QBs are rotated in a closed loop. Mathematicians call these rearrangements permutations. Similarly, the permutation of the edge QBs can also be expressed in a cycle. Instead of a cycle, we can break the permutation down into swaps, so called transpositions. The four cycle of the corner pieces can be replaced by three consecutive transpositions written from right to left. First swap QB1 and QB3, then swap QB1 with QB9, and finally swap QB1 with QB7. It is easy to see that every four cycle is broken down into at least three transpositions. Now we add a turn of the top face. The resulting permutation is a 5 cycle for the corner pieces and a 7 cycle for the edge pieces. This corresponds to 4 and 6 transpositions. Can you spot any pattern? Obviously, we could add the same transposition twice without affecting the overall configuration, because the two transpositions would cancel each other out. Therefore, the total number of transpositions is not a convincing candidate for a constraint. However, when we are faced with a legal configuration, an odd number of edge transpositions will always be balanced by an odd number of corner transpositions, and similarly, an even number of edge transpositions will be accompanied by an even number of corner transpositions. Now going back to our screwdriver setup, we can position 6 out of 8 corners arbitrarily. However, the placement of the last two corner pieces must yield an even or an odd number of transpositions that matches the parity of the edge transpositions. Therefore, we lose again half of the remaining configurations. Now that we've explored all these constraints, let's go back and update our numbers based on what we've learned. Because of the edge parity constraint, we lose the ability to freely orient the last edge. This eliminates one factor of two from our count. The corner triality constraint forces the orientation of the last corner and eliminates one factor of three. Finally, the edge corner transposition constraint removes the choice for the position of the second to last corner piece. Taking all these adjustments into account, the number of screwdriver configurations is reduced by a factor of 12, which brings us to the final number of 43 quintillion states. Now you might be wondering, how can we be sure we've accounted for all the possible constraints? That is a fair question. While we've put a lot of effort into our reasoning, we are still working with a heuristic approach. In other words, a rigorous proof is still missing. As a teaser, you can see in front of your eyes how a computer algebra system can quickly verify the 43 quintillion configurations. All the system needs to know is how the faces of the QBs permute when you rotate the faces of the magic cube. This time, we assign the numbers from 1 to 48 to each face that can change position and use the standard Singmaster notation to denote rotations, where, for instance, the capital F means the front face rotates and the prime indicates a counterclockwise direction. Interestingly, the three dimensional structure of the Rubik's Cube is completely irrelevant to this algorithm, and all the constraints we've talked about are encoded within these permutation operations. The computer algebra package finds the solution in fractions of a second. Are you curious about how the underlying algorithm works? That's exactly what we'll be diving into in the next video. If you are interested, be sure to stay tuned. I'm looking forward to seeing you again. That's all for today. Bye bye.